under the speaker's announced policy of january third two thousand and seventeen the chair recognizes the gentleman from texas mr gomez for thirty minutes Yes, sir. Well, it's uh, Thursday evening in the House of Representatives and continue to hear friends, fellow members of the House, reporters in anguish over the issue of a potential wall between the United States and Mexico. So I thought it was worth looking at some information about Mexico, our closest neighbor to the south. Um, some data should be recent. They've got nearly 120 million um, people in Mexico, gross domestic product around um, 2.1 trillion in pesos, 2.1% uh, growth, terrible. Um, it's about like the Obama economy. Average income around $17,000 per capita. Inflation, 4.0%, percent, 4.0%. .0%. But you look at the, the economics of Mexico in the world, and you think, wow, you look at their resources, Extraordinary resources, just extraordinary resources. And we know they got hardworking people because we know from the people of Mexico that have come to the United States, people constantly indicate, gee, they're best workers we have, these hardworking folks from Mexico. So if you got hardworking people in the nation of Mexico, You've got incredible natural resources that have never been tapped or not adequately tapped. We don't even know the full potential. Oil, gas, copper, all these different uh, minerals that Mexico is supposed to have. And you look at what people have done over the thousands of years I mean, advanced civilizations, why is Mexico not one of the top ten or even top five economies in the world? Um, it's listed 62nd in the world. Well, they've got plenty of land. I can personally testify they have some some of the most beautiful terrain in the world, beautiful beaches, mountains, farming regions, just magnificent land, minerals, and hardworking people. Why is it 62nd in the world as an economy? Well, that's... Uh, an interesting question. And it would seem to be because from hearing people that have looked at Mexico and have either tried to start a business there, looked at it to start a business there, start manufacturing there. Of course, there are many that have, that have set up manufacturing shop down there, but uh, they're easily persuaded out of it if they can find more suitable place and the reason it's often easy to persuade people to set up shop somewhere else is because of 
the drug cartels, the corruption that the drug cartels bring to Mexico? And what is it the drug cartels are making billions of dollars off of that allow them to corrupt police departments, city governments, the Mexican Border Patrol, Mexican military. Obviously, the people in, in all of the Mexican government are not corrupt. I've met too many that want desperately to make a Mex the nation of Mexico one of the greatest in the world. And it's possible that could happen. But not so long as the drug cartels are potentially the most powerful entities in Mexico. I mean, they're right next to the United States. They really should be one of the top at least 10, if not top five or top three or four economies in the world. But they're nowhere close. Drug cartels, we've found, we know, make money, particularly off shipping uh, illegal drugs into the United States. We made a fortune off of it. I've heard from <clears throat> friends of mine in Texas that are in the drug enforcement business, both federal and state, that when the U.S. Congress took action to make it more difficult to get Sudafed, which uh, is used in the cooking of substances put together in order to create methamphetamine, uh, that meth labs became much more rare, especially in East Texas, where I live, where we've got lots of trees, woods, um, terrain where people can easily hide out, cook some methamphetamine, especially uh, as developed during my time on a felony bench where people in Texas learned how to cook methamphetamine, create methamphetamine with a cold cooking process that didn't subject them to quite the danger and then create quite the nasty smell that often got meth labs reported to the authorities. And by drying up so many of the meth labs, we were, we were told it's going to be a great day for America. We dropped the meth labs by making it tougher to get Sudafed because you have to ask, give your driver's license, you've restricted uh, to a very limited amount of Sudafed. Well, we were told that's going to dry up drugs. It's methamphetamine is going to be a thing of the past. We'll cut it to next to nothing. Well, it's true. It's not as widespread as it used to be, but I'm told that um, more pure drugs with much more devastating results, more, much more addictive are coming up from Mexico, greater numbers, greater quantities, and it's even worse than it was when methamphetamine was being cooked because of the purity of the substances and the addictive nature. And that also as a result of drying up so much in the way of methamphetamine, we have much more of a heroin epidemic uh, crossing America. But as additional drugs have come from Mexico across, across our porous border that is, seems to have grown during the Obama administration dramatically, uh, why? Because 
our border just really has not particularly been all that enforced. And uh, it turns out it's not just um, other drugs that are coming across our border. Since we've been able to eliminate so many meth labs, especially in Texas, uh, we see stories like this one from Bob Price, January 5th. Fed sees nearly $7 million in meth, methamphetamine, at the Texas border. Um, and that's a story about the seizure of methamphetamine at two international border bridges in South Texas in one week. And uh, that the Customs and Border Protection, CBP, uh, that was assigned to the World Trade Center International Bridge in Laredo, it, this article reports how they had caught the two drug traffickers, um, 200 pounds of crystal meth in one vehicle. And that was um, December 22nd of 2016. But we also know the border security under this administration has become just almost non-existent. Uh, we had an article from January 12th today that uh, from McAllen and from Fox News that cartels, smugglers exploit border wall fears ahead of Trump presidency. So apparently they're using this time uh, before President Trump is sworn in next week to scare people into uh, come now, bring your drugs now, come illegally now into the U.S. before Trump becomes president. I guess it's a bit akin to Iran after holding American hostages for over a year under Commander-in-Chief Jimmy Carter became so scared of a tough, independent-minded Ronald Reagan coming into office, they let those hostages go on the very day he was sworn in, so they didn't risk him taking military action against them. Uh, this story from Jessica Vaughn, January 2017 reports that ICE deportations hit a 10-year low. This is January 2017. DHS has hit a 10-year low in deportations. We see stories about how border control is almost non-existent on our southern border. Uh, stories that... Um, Expectation of amnesty is attracting immigrants to our border. Uh, another story from January 10th, Brittany Hughes, border agents catch another wave of illegal aliens from Cuba amid escalating spike. And I've been told when I'm down there, they're seeing more and more Cubans coming across the Mexican border of all places. So... The insecurity, not mentally in the United States, but the actual insecurity of the United States because of our vulnerability to people that hate us and drug cartels that want to make billions of dollars by hooking people on drugs that they will deliver, uh, has reached insane levels. And that, that's probably part of the reason that Donald Trump was elected president by an avalanche in the Electoral College. And if you look at the counties that voted for Hillary Clinton and you look at the counties that voted for Donald Trump, it becomes very clear that the Democratic Party in the United States is basically become a fringe party. They won the fringes. West Coast, East Coast, part of Florida, part of 
the Northeast, Chicago, Detroit, some of the northern cities, the uh, Southern Valley, Texas. I mean, it's a fringe party. A few exceptions inside the country, but basically the rock-solid interior uh, that the Americans make up in what some refer to as flyover country in America voted rather solidly for Donald Trump. And when you look at the numbers, uh, here's numbers from the CIA World Factbook. Um, crude oil exports, um, a 2015 es estimate, had 1.199 million barrels per day. Uh, country comparison to the world, 13. Crude oil imports, 11,110 barrels a day. Uh, crude oil, proved reserves, 9.7 billion barrels. And, and that's just proven reserves. If you look at natural gas from a 2014 estimate, 44.37 billion uh, cubic meters. Uh, that's supposed to be 19th in the world. But when you consider how productive they could become once they begin fracking, using more advanced technology, then you find out that, uh, wow, this is a nation, the nation of Mexico, that really should be one of the top ten economies in the world. What's the excuse that it's not? Hardworking people, natural resources that most of the world could only envy, why is it not one of the top ten? And we keep coming back to the drug cartels and the corruption that they brought to Mexico and the billions of dollars that are generated by the drug cartels. So we've talked about here in the House, you have um, the Border Patrolman tell me, and I've been there all night, there's not a single inch of the U.S.-Mexico border that is not controlled by one of the drug cartels and that nobody should cross the, the border unless they have paid the drug cartels, have the drug cartels' permission. And, you know, seeing firsthand how it works, they'll send a group across the river with coyotes and rafts when they're down on the Rio Grande. That keeps the Border Patrol busy. And at another place, they send people with drugs. Uh, I've been there and seen their lookouts climb up on perches where they can watch. And when the Border Patrol goes by, they know they won't be back for a while, so they get surprised when I drive by in the middle of the night. Um, but, I mean, they're, they're all over the place around our southern border. They're making billions of dollars. And whoever came up with the business model for the drug cartels that you could make such massive amount of money bringing drugs illegally into the United States, it, it was really a business genius. But it would take a business fool in the United States to allow the kind of model that Mexico has set up for its drug business to even get a foothold in the United States. But as I've mentioned, one of the uh, Border Patrol told me that the drug cartels call Department of Homeland Security their logistics. They bring their drug dealers, they bring their 
drug traffickers or people, unfortunately, girls that are being forced often into drug trafficking or human trafficking, and they're going to be used as prostitutes to make money for the drug cartels. They send them across, and as the Border Patrolman said, they send them across, and then DHS here in America becomes their logistics. We ship them wherever they want them to go in the United States. All they have to do oftentimes is just have a zero. I've seen them, a Xerox copy of the address where they're supposed to go. Um, and DHS puts them on the bus, sometimes flies them, but usually buses, and uh, ships them off to a city where the drug cartels want them to set up shop. And been there in the middle of the night when Border Patrolmen will ask um, how much they paid to get be brought in illegally into the U.S. And some of the um, Hispanic uh, Spanish speakers in our Border Patrol are really incredible. And as they drill down and get answers to their questions that are not always on the list that DHS tells them to get. How much money did you pay? They'd say, but you don't have that much. You didn't have $6,000, $7,000, $8,000. Where'd you get that money? Well, I, I was able to get 1000 from somebody in the U.S., 1000 from somebody in Mexico or Guatemala or whatever. And well, what, what about the rest? Well, I'm supposed they're going to let me pay that out after I'm in the United States. It becomes clear very quickly that once again this business model that the drug cartels have includes getting people in rafts where the Rio Grande River requires a raft or just getting them across in unguarded areas or areas there where we need a wall and don't have one, getting them across and then getting them to DHS, get DHS to send them to the city where they want them to set up shop as drug traffickers, human, human traffickers. And what a business model. You get the federal government of the United States to help you set up your business machine, your business model in the United States. They're shipping your employees around the country to different cities. And, yes, it's normally under the guise of I have a relative there. Here's the relative's address. This is where I want to go. They're going to take care of me. And uh, perhaps you have, get delayed and have to wait for a, uh, an immigration judge that was appointed by uh, Eric Holder to give you a notice to appear for a hearing four years later, a year, two years, four years later sometimes. And then you can go on to the city where the drug cartels want you to finish paying off what you owe them for getting you into the United States. So to have a business model that requires your workers to pay you is extraordinary. But that's what drug cartels are able to do when you have a willing Obama administration here in the United States that will help you set up your drug cartel mechanism here in the United States. And that's what's been going on. In the meantime, back in Mexico, you generate so much money by having your workers pay you to, to work for you and getting billions of dollars from the drugs that are sent into the United States, hooking people here in America, making them reliant on and addicted to drugs that destroy their lives. So, I mean, basically the drug cartels get a twofer. They destroy the human infrastructure of the United States with poison that some would say, well, that's another name for illegal drugs. And then in the meantime, you got all that money coming to you, and you use that money to buy off police. Thank God 
there are some stand-up police in Mexico that can't be bought. But if they go too strongly head-to-head -head with a drug cartel, we've seen the pictures. They can end up with their head on a pike as a message. We've had chiefs of police that were killed when they refused to out to the drug cartels. And the message becomes pretty clear. So it seems to be that the biggest reason Mexico, with extraordinary people, extraordinary natural resources, a beautiful, fantastic country in which they're located, a location that is just incredibly advantageous because they've got shipping that can go out on the West Coast like we do through the Pacific, shipping that can go out to the East Coast, um, into the Caribbean, to the Gulf of Mexico, uh, ready access to North American markets, ready access to South American markets. What an opportunistic location for Mexico, yet they struggle so far behind most nations or so many nations in the world, dozens and dozens, 60 or so before them, because drug cartels have such a powerful part in Mexico itself. So there are many Am Americans, and especially friends of mine across the aisle here, who think it is an absolute outrage to talk about building a wall between the United States and Mexico. There are some Mexican officials that think it's an outrage to talk about building a wall between the United States and Mexico. Now, some of those Mexican officials think it's an outrage because they haven't thought through the magnificence that may arise in Mexico once we have secured the border between Mexico and the United States and we can slow the drug trafficking to a trickle. And so the drug cartels will not be looking at billions of U.S. dollars. They'll be used, looking at, at thousands, or if they're extremely powerful, maybe millions, but we get that down to thousands, then the Mexican people will be able to have control without corruption, without massive pockets of corruption, without a drug cartel that can buy soldiers, buy police, buy chiefs of police, buy mayors. And again, thank God, it's only a small part of Mexico, but it keeps Mexico suppressed from the great economic power that it could be. And the potential is all there. You build a wall, then you shut down the drug cartels, and when they only have thousands of dollars to bribe police instead of millions or billions of dollars, then law and order will prevail, and the drug cartels will not. And we will have the most extraordinary neighbor to our south, all because we followed the example in Mending Wall, and we had a wall between us that we kept up, we took care of, we shut down, helped Mexico shut down the drug cartels by being a good neighbor, enforcing the border, and the standard of living in Mexico spirals upwards through the skies. The power Mexico would have as a nation in any international organization will be extraordinary, and the United States will reach unparalleled relationship as neighbors. That's worth building a wall.